Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for um, coming along to this session um, this afternoon. Um, I think you're going to find it interesting and informative and an innovative um, approach to supporting students in their transition to um, third level, and that's on the ITB campus, so the Institute of Technology in Blanchardstown. So my name is Suzanne McCarthy. I'm an educational psychologist working with the National Learning Network, which is part of the Rehab Group. Um, and this is my colleague, Nisha Webb, who is an assistant psychologist, also working with the National Learning Network, but we're both working on the campus um, of ITB and supporting students around their transition into um, third level. So I'm just going to um, talk to you, just I'll give you an overview of what we're going to cover over the next 20 minutes or so. So I'm just going to um, talk to you a little bit around this, the importance, I suppose, of the relationship between um, the National Learning Network and ITB and why, um, why we take this particular approach that we do. Um, and then how do we do that within a UDL framework? And then Nisha is going to look at the results of um, what we call learner profiling. So we'll talk to you a little bit more about what that is. And as I said, Nisha is going to talk you through the sort of typical trends and patterns um, and the results of, of that profiling um, that we do with this all first year students in, in the college in Blanchardstown. Um, and then she's also going to look at um, the feedback that we receive from the academic staff in ITB, uh, where they talk about how um, they use the information from the learner profiling to um, influence their teaching and learning in the, in the lecture rooms. And then um, the student engagement with our own services. So we provide one-to-one -one, um, education and psychological support to, um, the stu to a smaller number of students um, who have more complex needs and, um, and need that one-to-one -one support. And just a little bit of information about that around gender differences and um, the types of supports that the students are requesting. And then at the very end, then I'll just wrap up um, to talk about some of the challenges that we face in providing this type of support and taking this particular type of approach, but also the benefits of that approach um, and the outcomes for the students. So I suppose, where did this all come about? We started working with um, ITB back in 2003, and I suppose we had this shared vision and mission of how we wanted to support students at third level. And it was um, not just supporting the students who were presenting with a particular disability, um, but to be able to support all students, because we believed that students, um, that, that a, a high percentage of students need some level of support at some stage when they're in college. And that might not be in year one, it could be in year two or year three or year four. Um, and there's no disability office in um, Blanchardstown, which is unique in itself, I suppose, in some ways, that um, it's just student services and the National Learning Network. And I suppose students, um, feel less stigma attached to seeking the help then from, from the services because it doesn't have a big sign that says disability um, over the door. Um, I suppose it's unique as well in that it's a mainstream uh, education provider working alongside ourselves being a specialist education um, provider and the relationship and the partnership has worked really well and um, I think that's a really important part of, of the service. Um, both partners very much believe in an evidence-based approach to teaching and learning and to providing interventions and supports for the students. And then both partners also recognise, um, I suppose, that the importance of the relationship between students' social and emotional difficulties um, and, and the impact that that has on academic performance. So that we can't just provide, you know, um, I suppose, learning support around um, improving academic performance, but we also need to work with students around some of the social and emotional issues that they're presenting with. Um, so we take a very holistic approach, recognising the biological, psychological and social needs of, of each of the students who are seeking the help. Um, so how, how does that fit within the UDL framework? So 
what we do in Blanchestown is all incoming first year students um, undergo uh, what we call learner profiling as part of the induction. So they have the option to take part in investigating their own um, preferences in learning, their strengths and weaknesses across a number of different areas such as literacy, numeracy, um, uh, attention and concentration, social and communication um, skills and uh, coordination and organisation. And then they also complete a study skills questionnaire which is linked very much to studying at third level, so things around note taking, organisation, time management, reading for research, uh, reading for meaning, critical reflection and all of those kinds of areas. And as I said, Nisha is going to run through some of the results of that and the comparisons in gender and the comparisons in different um, schools uh, within the college. Um, so that's a support for all students. So all students get that opportunity to do that learner profiling and then get immediate feedback on their own learning profile. Um, and so we feel that's a way of supporting all students and it's a proactive way rather than reactive. So you're supporting students from day one, not waiting for them to kind of run into difficulties after the first kind of six weeks, but that you're giving them the strategies and tools um, from the beginning. And then there are still some students who will require more support um, and, and we feel that the academics can provide a lot of that support within the lecture room. So they provide, you know, to again within that sort of whole UDL uh, framework, so um, providing notes in advance and um, what, what we do is we provide the academic staff with the um, results of the profiling tool so that that has an influence in how the uh, lecturing staff um, approach their teaching and learning in the classroom. And then there are still a smaller percentage of students who still require that one-to-one -one support, which is again where that the NLN engagement bit where students come in and look for one-to-one -one support from ourselves. So I'm just going to hand over to Nisha now and she's going to run through the results of that profiling. Okay. Thanks, Suzanne. So, like Suzanne identified, the profiling tool is used to provide insight for the students into their own kind of cognitive processing style. So, uh, the first component of the uh, profiling tool is the learner profile. So, this does look at key, four key areas. So, the first will be coordination skills and organisation skills, attention and concentration skills, socialisation and communication skills, along with literacy and writing skills. So, of the 2015-2016 academic um, year, the incoming students of about 650 was our cohort that we were working with. Uh, of those students, 17% reported challenges in coordination and organisation skills. 17% reported challenges in attention and concentration skills. 15% uh, identified challenges in social and communication skills, but I think what's quite significant here is 28% uh, reported challenges for reading and writing skills. So again, this is information the students have when they're coming in straight away, they're able to reflect on their reports, but we're able to identify this from the onset. In contrast with the learner profile, the second component of the profiling tool is the study skills profile. So this explores the student's strengths more so in an academic uh, standpoint. So such as reading and writing basics, reading for understanding, critical reflection, organization and time management, and additionally note-taking, planning for writing. Again, more academic approach. And as you can see, there's a lot more kind of discrepancies in the challenges and strengths that the students are facing. So of this first year cohort, 40% um, of the students reported challenges with reading and writing basics. 49%, almost half of the students reported challenges for reading for understanding and critical reflection. 40% experienced challenges for organisation time management. 35% um, reported challenges for note taking and planning for writing. When we dug into this data just a little bit further, we divided the respondents up into the different schools um, within the college. So three main schools. We looked at the engineering and informatics school, which would have included uh, courses such as engineering, computing, mechatronics, horticulture, and creative digital media. We also looked at the School of Humanities, 
which included create, um, community and youth development, uh, early childhood care and education, along with social care. And we also looked at the School of Business, which would comprise a lot of the business courses uh, within ITB. So when we were comparing um, between the schools in across the uh, two different uh, components of the profiling tool, you know, in some areas, we were able to identify that there were quite similar um, challenges and strengths being identified. So reading in the learner profile was identified as quite a consistent challenge or not so much uh, in comparison to all the um, all of the schools. Reading and writing basics and reading for understanding in the study skills was again quite consistent. However, in comparison, we were able to identify that there were some challenges uh, between and um, some contrasts between the schools uh, looking at it a bit further. For example, um, the School of Engineering and Informatics did identify higher challenges in both note-taking and organisation in comparison to the School of Humanities. Okay, so going back to our kind of, uh, <laughs> our um, dynamic triangle of interaction, um, we are very conscious that, you know, the lecture feedback, um, the lectures are so important in terms of supporting the students in that UDL framework. Uh, once the students have that opportunity to, re to review their own profiling, we do, uh, we do provide the lectures with um, a summary of the student profile that they will see um, as taken from the profiling data. So we asked the lecturers um, whether they believe that there are any benefits in receiving the learner profile and how that affects their classroom teaching and learning. 85% of the lecturers that did respond to our survey identified that there was a great benefit to receiving the learner profile. 10% uh, said they didn't feel that there was any benefits and 5% were unsure. So when we prompted how the lecturing staff incorporated uh, Universal Design for Learning in their classroom activities, three main themes emerged from the feedback. An overwhelmingly positive 85% of the feedback that we received did identify actions and responses in the UDL framework such as, I adopt my teaching method to suit these students or provide them with materials prior to class if needed. There was 15% of the feedback we received which uh, did identify a lack of action or response in UDL, such as, I read the reports, but just lecture as usual. And a final theme emerged where staff were uncertain regarding their personal competency in UDL, um, with one quote stating, no, in that I am not equipped to deal with some issues, which I think is, you know, quite important to take uh, account of at the same time. So some examples of that feedback from that 85% of the lectures that we received uh, is up here, as you can see. So uh, some lectures identified a collaborative approach, open learning, discussing, discussion, sorry, reflective practice. <laughs> Uh, one lecturer identified that they ensure that all the lecture is inclusive of all abilities. And another lecturer identified SIF, so try and include different teaching styles to suit different various learning styles. So the final aspect of our kind of uh, triage uh, is how the students actually engage with our service with the National Learning Network. So. In 2015, there were a total of 155 students that engaged with the service. I think what's worth noting here is that while 47 students that engaged with the service were registered with a disability, that is to say that uh, they were funded by the Higher Education Authority, 108 of the students were not registered with a disability. So again, this was kind of highlighting for us the importance of that inclusive campus-wide service. And following on from that, looking in a little bit more depth at our engagement data. Uh, of those 155 students that engaged, there was a total of 631 uh, appointments made with the service overall. 
Again, similar trends can be identified as before, where there was 209 students, HEA registered, registered with a disability, that engaged with the service in comparison to twice that, just over twice that, 422 engagements with students that were not registered with disabilities. So looking in on those engagements uh, pieces, we identified that the majority of the service was being used for um, academic supports. So 42% of our sessions would have been academic, which does kind of come back to what the data was saying from our profiling tool, where there was a lot of challenges across the board for all, all students in the study skills profiler. We also were able to identify that 18, following on from that, the next most common uh, engagement of the service was assessment at 18%, and following on from that, wellness supports at 11%. I think it is important to note that um, the kind of engagement with the service, so who is accessing for what. Um, females were more, um, were more engaged with the service in terms of seeking academic support and wellness support, um, which is quite consistent with the literature. But quite interestingly, males were more likely to seek out um, assessment or social supports. So I'll pass it back over to Suzanne now. Okay, so um, some of the challenges, I suppose, that um, that I mentioned earlier, that uh, you know, in terms of providing this type of support. Um, we know from the research that some students are more vulnerable to withdrawal um, and particularly those with disabilities or those with mental health difficulties but we also know that they're more successful once they're appropriate, uh, supported appropriately so I suppose by um, using an approach like this where we're you know offering support to all students coming in in first year um, in, in week one, we feel that it's a very proactive way of um, trying to, you know, trying to um, get around that issue of um, students dropping out maybe in the first semester or within the first six to eight weeks of the first semester. Um, the students, I suppose, we've been working in this area since 2003, and the complexity of the students who are presenting to us, the complexity of the of the difficulties that they're presenting with, has increased hugely. And more students are presenting with multiple diagnoses than they used to before. And what I mean by that is more than one diagnostic label. So we'll have students who might come in with, you know, saying that they are on paper that they have um, autism and that they have depression and anxiety and that they might have you know one or two other labels on top of that and for a lot of the students they don't understand what half of the labels mean so there's a huge piece of work around that around trying to um, I suppose what we call psychoeducation of of the particular labels but also uh, awareness raising across the campus for the for the staff um, uh, for the lecturing staff and for all staff on a campus um, to to kind of just to make people a little bit more aware and feel less threatened, I suppose, by these complicated labels. Um, and then uh, the numbers of students presenting with mental health difficulties, uh, ASD and ADHD, I think all um, colleges around the country would agree with the fact that the numbers have increased hugely in those areas. And again, it's about trying to support teaching staff um, to manage that because teaching staff have told us you know about the difficulties in classroom and they kind of refer to behavioral difficulties within the classroom setting as well and it's about trying to um, help them overcome some of those difficulties and again I think awareness um, around those diagnostic labels helps with that and so we do um, provide uh, workshops and seminars across the campus for various different staff, not just the teaching staff, but also other administrative staff um, and people within the student services area as well. Um, and then just some of the outcomes for the students themselves in providing this type of support. We believe strongly in front-loading supports in first year and we really feel um, and we know from the student engagement figures and um, of our particular service that by providing as much support in first year for students um, 
then they're able to self-manage their own difficulties by the time they get through first year. We all know, those of us who have been through the college system, that first year, once you get through first year, it's a big, um, it's a big barrier to overcome and, and you kind of settle in after that. So we've very few students in second year or third year or fourth year who access support from ourselves. Sometimes when they get to fourth year and they're doing a thesis, they come back to us for a little bit more support. But generally, we see that it's just first year students. So they've learned to self-manage the difficulties. We, I, I suppose our ethos and mission as part of the service is to uh, promote independence and empower the learners to be able to self-manage their difficulties, to improve their self-esteem, um, achieve academically, gain skills and awards, work on the kind of skills, I suppose, as part of that kind of holistic approach that we take. It's about preparing um, the students for um, employment afterwards so by giving them the kind of support that they need early on and then imp you know uh, empowering them I suppose as I said to be able to manage on their own with those particular strategies and Im improving their quality of life and health and wellness um, and then just finally to say as well about you know the the work that we do with the academic staff the feedback that we get from them once we go down that road of providing the sort of profiling um, information for them and then they begin to think about uh, the way that they're teaching their particular modules. And one project that we worked on a couple of years ago was where academic staff um, took uh, time out to reflect on the way that they were teaching um, based on this profiling information and changed whole modules of how they delivered the material in class. And then after that, there were just a small number of academic staff who took part in this, but at the end of it, they showcased uh, their work and how they had actually gone from this kind of uh, sage on the stage, more to guide on the side and changing the, the way that they presented information and offering different assessment, assessment um, methods as well for the students at the end. And the feedback from both students and staff was that they would never go back to the way that they used to um, teach in the past and that and the, the learners or the students themselves uh, stated that they much preferred the lectures in this new format than, than previously. And so that's the end of our presentation. So I think, I'm not sure if we have, I think we have time for some questions, if anybody has. Um, just wondering about that uh, survey you do for the study skills or the profile. Is that something that you um, developed yourself? Or is it a uh, national? Uh, yeah, it's, it's actually a licensed um, piece of, uh, it's a program that's licensed. We. Um, we were part of the development um, of the tool way back in 2003, and then it's it's kind of gone from there. But it's a lady called Amanda Kirby in Wales who um, sells the license for the tool. So we just buy in the license every year to be able to use it in the college. And it has the, the sort of more specific kind of strengths and weaknesses part of it to do with kind of specific learning difficulties. And then it has a study skills section as well attached to it. Yeah.